everybody. Uh, welcome to Interactive Stargazing. My name is Haley. I'm one of our educators here, and I'm joined by Wesley, another educator. Hello. <laughs> so uh, today we're just going to be going through some objects, showing you guys uh, things that we can see that you request. So feel free to request stuff in the chat. And um, yeah, so uh, Wes, do you want to start off by talking about what we're looking at here? Yes, this is one of my favorite things to look at uh, in the night sky or through a telescope or, well, I guess you can't really, you need a telescope. You can't look at this with your eyes. Anyway, <laughs> you can't look at it with your eyes because it's very, 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 very far away from us. Uh, this is an object called M51. Uh, and it's two different galaxies that are doing something that has a very fun name. Uh, these galaxies are close enough together that the force of gravity between them is pulling them together more than dark energy is ripping them apart. And we call that galactic cannibalism. It's very fun. Yeah, galactic cannibalism is probably one of my favorite scientific terms. And um, basically what's happening here is we can see the two bright spots there. Those are the centers of these two galaxies. Now, something really cool about spiral galaxies like these ones is that at the very center of each one of them is a supermassive black hole. So black holes are super neat. And it looks like uh, Daniel Maltez asked to see Cygnus X1. Um, unfortunately, that is a black hole. So and we can see those black holes. Exactly. We, <laughs> um, them. we could show you where we know it to be, but these telescopes are not quite powerful enough to actually detect any black holes for the most part. You need some like colossally big telescopes to be able to do stuff like that, to detect very minute shifts and things and see black yeah. holes very far away. Yeah, the, uh, the black hole we took a picture of actually, that guy was uh, 50 million light years away and we took it, uh, we took that picture with a telescope the size of the earth. Yeah, that's so, always my favorite story. They just yeah. like you can you can like daisy chain telescopes together and like use them to composite a really, really, really big image. And that's exactly yeah. And even just... then, you're not even technically seeing a black hole. It was just that the orange stuff was the accretion disk around it. Because you can't technically see black holes. Yeah, technically. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, no, black holes are super neat. Um, uh, it's actually really funny that you asked to see that because I'm known as the black hole lady here. So that's like all I ever talk about. Um, but uh, something really cool that's going to happen to Whirlpool Galaxy is that the centers of uh, these two galaxies, right, these two bright spots have supermassive black holes inside of them. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to get super close and they're going to like do a little death dance, basically going spiraling into one another. And really, 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 really fast together. Yes, exactly like Brian is doing with the mouse right now. That is exactly what they will be doing. <laughs> Yeah. And they cause exactly. they like cause like ripples like in space mouse. time when they crash together is the is the most insane thing. They like vibrate the fabric of reality. And oh, we yeah. built we built a really big machine that can test it. Humans are fun. We built two. It's true. Yeah, yeah we did build two of them. Yeah. Yeah, the LIGO instruments. So uh we actually theorized that this could happen ever since we knew that black holes existed. And we were like, okay, well, we'll never be able to see that happen, right? Because the fabric of space-time rippling is not something that humans are able to comprehend. Yeah, so, not exactly. Yeah, so we built the LIGO instruments. They're two L-shaped instruments where um, the there's like light that'll come in to the, to the branch and it'll split into two beams and then they'll hit two platforms and come back and the light will connect. And if it's in phase, so the two uh, light sources are moving the same way, then nothing happened. And if it's out of phase and they're shifted, right, they're not moving the same way, that means that the fabric of space-time itself rippled. So it's, it's really cool. They opened, that, uh, they opened that up in 2016. And I think it was within like minutes or hours of it being open, they detected a space-time Yeah, rippled. they like immediately find one. Uh, cashier, yeah. just so you know, um, Part of the reason that uh, Virgo is your birthday month is that, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we're like super not able to see it right now because it being a zodiac constellation means that it's on this path that the the uh, stars, that, well, that our sun and the, all the planets and our moon travel through the night sky, and that's why it's a zodiac constellation, and that's why they're important in astrology. And so, if it is your birth sign month, it means that 
currently it's sort of where the sun is right now is where that star sign is. So we can't see Virgo right now. Yeah, Virgo will be up uh, sometime. It's like a spring constellation during the nighttime. So during the daytime, it's up like right now. But yeah, um, and it looks like uh, yeah. Book Davies asked about big planets, Saturn and Jupiter. Um, so super exciting. Both of those are up right now. So we can go take a look at those. Uh, which one do you think we should start with, Wesley? Oh, let's start with uh, we could do Jupiter first because Saturn's a little higher in the sky. So if we start with Jupiter, we can go to Saturn and hopefully it'll look prettier. Yeah, perfect. Not that Jupiter won't look pretty. It's a very cool object. Mm -hmm. uh, Terry Rhodes, just so you know, it looks like NGC 4565 is below the tree line right now. So we're not able to see it. Mm -hmm. And it looks yeah, like so Brian has brought us Jupiter. Look at that. There so is. the thing about our Malenkamp is it's structured specifically to take pictures of like deep space objects. So it can take in like tons and tons of light and give us images like what we just saw of M51. With Jupiter, it is so close that we need to lower the exposure rate quite a bit to be able to see any kind of detail on it. So you can see here that uh, Brian, the guy who's operating our Malin cam, he had to turn the exposure rate down a whole lot to be able to see these bands here. And then um, all the way down. it's getting around near the, the amount of time that your eye exposes for, which is kind of wild. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just if you had eyes that were 14 inches in diameter, first off, you would look really yeah. scary, but um, you would be able to see it kind of like this. So, you know, it's a trade off. Like, do you really like astronomy that much? I mean, up <laughs> what to you. length are you willing to go to to see Jupiter? Yeah, exactly. And um, also to be fully blind during the day. <laughs> <laughs> True. You'd have to be nocturnal. There's yeah. no way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely not. Um, so what Brian just did is, he's, is he turned up the exposure rate so that now we can't see detail on Jupiter, but we can see its moons right now. Moons. So um, it looks like from left to right, we have Io, which is uh, one of the smallest moons, or well, it's the smallest of Jupiter's four largest moons, so the Galilean moons. So we've got Io, and then uh, Europa, then there's Jupiter, and then uh, Callisto and Ganymede. Those are the four Galilean moons, because those are the moons that Galileo saw with his teeny tiny little telescope. Exactly. They're also used to help prove that the sun didn't go around the Earth. At the time, it was sort of thought that everything we could see went around the Earth, and so everything had to go around the Earth. But these were some objects that Galileo was able to point at and say, hey, these are definitively not going around the Earth even a little bit. So oh, they yeah. sort of used to help prove that, which is cool. It's fun to mm -hmm. hear about that. Yeah. All right. So um, it looks like we've got quite a few requests. That's awesome. Yes, um, you did ask to see Saturn, though. Yes. So let's go to Saturn. Yeah. Saturn's really cool. Saturn's very well known for its rings, but a fun fact about Saturn is that all of the rest of the gas giants also have rings. It's just that the rest of them are incredibly difficult to see, whereas Saturn's are pretty easy to see because they're mostly made of water ice, which, as you probably know, is very reflective. Mm -hmm. One of the most reflective materials out there. Oh, Joe's hi. Aww. I miss you so much. <laughs> Joe's is one of our educators who left us a little bit ago. So, um, oh, I'm glad you're watching. But yeah, so um, you can see here, like with Jupiter, we lowered the exposure rate on Saturn so that we can see uh, the nice little gap between uh, the rings and the planet. And one of my favorite facts about Saturn was also from Galileo. When he looked at Saturn, it was with this tiny little telescope and he could like barely see the gap between the rings and the planet. And when it's at certain angles, he couldn't really see it at all. So he said that Saturn had ears because they looked like ears on the sides of the planet. I didn't know that. That's hysterical. Oh, it's great. <laughs> but yeah, so you can see uh, this little dude. And um, if you blow out the exposure, we can see some moons of Saturn as well. Hit it, Brian. <laughs> Brian's the brains behind the operation. Wesley and I are just the pretty faces, you know. <laughs> it's true. It's why we make the big bucks. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um uh 
just so everybody that's asking about it knows, uh, we should be able to see Andromeda tonight, but we're going to wait a little bit so it kind of looks nicer. It's a little close to the horizon right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then um, there's a couple of other objects that we'll get to uh, after this that we can see. Um, but it looks like um, we can see some of those moons there. So, uh, Wesley, do you want to point those guys out? Yes, I would love to point these guys out. So, <laughs> I am blind. Where am I? There we go. Um, okay, so it looks like the one on sort of the bottom left, Brian, would you point at that one for me? That one appears to be Titan. Um, and then directly above Saturn is Dione, and then Rhea and Tethys. Oh, those are right next to each other, aren't they? Good lord. Mm -hmm. Little yeah. tiny. Usually all four of them are, are really, really close to Saturn, but Titan's sort of a little further away today. Titan needed some space it from the rest of the space. family. <laughs> There's lots of space in space. Oh, yeah. Lots of distance between yeah. things in space. It's very true. Yeah. But yeah, so it looks like uh, Paulette would like to see M39, an open cluster in Cygnus. So, um, Oh, I totally skipped over. I'm so sorry. Daniel uh, asked for the star Vega. So let's Vega, do that of first. course. I love that yeah. star. That used to be our North Star. Mm -hmm. And in about 12,000 years, mark your calendars, it'll be our North Star again. You just have to wait for the Earth to very slowly wobble over this direction. Oh, yeah. I fully plan on waiting for that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also plan on being around for it. <laughs> oh, yeah. We have to be. <laughs> it's true. But yeah, so uh, the bright star Vega is actually one of my favorite stars to talk about because right behind the sun, it is the most studied star out there. So Vega Spectra is actually the first star other than uh, the Earth star uh, that we actually took a spectrum of. So it was uh, super duper neat. And um, also, if we have any fans of the book and uh, movie Contact, this star was featured there, right? Oh, so in the movie, Jodie Foster, the star she ends up going to is Vega. So it's pretty neat. But yeah, um, it looks like we blew it out um, for those uh, diffraction spikes. So you can see uh, that's like what a stereotypical drawing of a star would look like, right? So, um, but I think it's really cool. And we've got that nice like blue color, Vega is, a blue star, so it's very large, hot, it's a younger star, and I'm pretty sure it's about 25 light years away, if I'm not mistaken, which is pretty close. It's one of the closer stars to us. That's why so, it's so bright. It's the fifth brightest star in the night sky? I believe it's right? the fifth, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a cool looking So um, that's the bright star, Vega. It's now, also rotating so fast that it's almost ripping itself apart. Sorry, I talked over you. <laughs> oh, that's totally true. Yeah, no, thanks for chiming in. I totally forgot about that. <laughs> um, but yeah, now uh, if we want to see more bright stars, we can go to M39, which is an open star cluster. So that's just Brian like a away. bunch of <laughs> Um. Oh, and so it looks like, um, how do we focus the telescope so quickly? So the telescope is always focused to the camera. Now, um, if you notice, Brian is switching between two softwares. So there's uh, one software that moves the telescope around, and then there is another uh, software, the Malin Cam, which is where we put together all the pictures. So um, it's actually really cool to see the plane waves move around because they're super quick and really quiet. We call them our ninja telescopes because they're they just- They always sneak up on zoom. people, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and people are always shocked at how quiet they are, which is pretty cool. Every time. So. Every time we have tour groups over there, they're always like, oh my God, it's moving. I didn't even hear anything. Yeah, exactly. Um, do you want to talk about uh, uh, open star clusters? Uh, yes, I would love to talk about open star clusters. Sorry, my computer monitor is being weird. Um, oh, no. Yeah, open star clusters are really cool. They're one of two different sort of main types of star clusters. And open star clusters they have a little bit of a looser definition than the other kind that I won't talk about yet. Um, generally, they're much, 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 much younger. Um, and they also contain a lot of stars that are brighter and bluer, generally. Um, and they can occasionally, things that we will call being in the same open cluster, are 
not necessarily quite as close as things in the other type of cluster that shall currently remain nameless. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so um, that is the Cygnus open cluster. So uh, very, very neat. I once ha I was talking about this with, I think she was like, like a five or six year old girl. And oh, I was like, cool. yeah, there are a bunch of stars that were like born out of the same nebula, like cloud of ga ga uh, gas and dust out in space. And she was like, oh, so they're like siblings. And I was like, yes, they're like siblings. That is so cute. <laughs> yeah, so I will only refer to them as siblings from now on. Oh, kids. Yeah. Um, That's so cute. <laughs> um, so it looks like Tom C is asking for NGC 3675 and or 4605. So it looks like 4605, we might be able to get it. We're going to check it out, see if it's behind the Goto. If it is, you'll get a really pretty shot of just building. So <laughs> Love building. <laughs> Big fan of building. Oh, yeah. And then uh, 3675 is completely behind the trees. So we won't be able to see that one, oh, unfortunately. Yeah. But um, yeah, it looks like they're going to try for uh, the 45 or 40. Oh, my gosh. 4605. <laughs> It looks like it's real, real close to the horizon. So we'll see All how right. this works out here. Mm -hmm. And this is a good time to talk about it. So um, right now we're experiencing a little bit of haze. I think it's mostly in like the southern sky right now. So some of the, these images might look a little more like yellowish orangish than normal. And that would be why is because we've got some, uh, it looks to be either smoke or some sort of like crazy dust or something, more than likely smoke. Uh, this is Arizona and there's fires here all the time. So <laughs> I would not be surprised. <laughs> but yeah. House your campfires, please. Yes, please, please. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, have we moved it? I can't see. Yeah, I think, I think we're on 40. Oh, he's taking the exposure. Yeah. So at the bottom you can see there's a gray bar that's slowly filling up and that's the exposure. So oh, it looks like go. right now, tiny, really tiny. good. Um, it, <laughs> it looks like right now we're taking about a 45 second exposure, which it looks like he's actually going to lower that exposure so that we can get a little bit more detail out of this guy. Um, but yeah, so um, it looks like, what is it? 45 or 4605. I keep, I keep saying that. Um, so, um, tiny galaxy. Yeah, it's a little tiny galaxy. Well, probably um, not tiny. Probably just very far away from us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> true. Scope. Very true. Um, so this guy is a uh, dwarf barred spiral galaxy. Ah, it is a little tiny guy. Ooh, it is a little tiny, dude. So uh, dwarf irregular galaxies, they're much smaller than your uh, average typical galaxy, something like Whirlpool that we were looking at or like the Milky Way, things like that. So um, it looks like this guy, he's actually got a bar of dust in there, which is uh, pretty neat, right? Um, but yeah, so it's in the constellation Ursa Major. So um, that's like real close to the horizon. So I'm really glad we could actually see this because this is this is really cool. I don't think I've ever seen this one before. Have yeah, you? I don't think I have either. This is this is a pretty guy. Mm -hmm. He's cute little It's cool dude. looking. Yeah, yeah, I'm a fan. Yeah, I like it. it. Looks super similar nice to uh, another regular galaxy called Cigar Galaxy. But... Ah, the Cigar Galaxy or Bode's Nebula. It's not a nebula. Also, there's a different thing named Bode's Nebula. Oh, yeah. Astronomers are terrible at naming things. They Just really are. Awful. <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> um, okay, so it's looking like what else we got? Lots what of stuff in here. For? Um, um, lots for the Andromeda Galaxy. Like we said, we'll be able to see it probably more. around like nine. Um, How about M twenty seven? Can you give me? Can you give me some dumbbell nebula, Brian? Oh yeah. Yes. Anything for you, Joe's. <laughs> <laughs> and this th this category of object we're going to go look at now it's called the dumbbell nebula it's what's known as a planetary nebula it has nothing to do with planets in the slightest again astronomers terrible at naming things what these kinds of objects are these planetary nebulas they're stars that used to be similar to our sun that have since died and when a star like that dies what happens is oh that's neat all those tails you see there are from the camera moving as this picture was exposing um but 
when stars like our sun die, what happens is they sort of don't have enough gravity to hold on to all their outer layers. And so the radiation pressure that they're causing in their cores by smashing elements together and making energy, well, kind of making it, you know what I mean. Anyway, they lose all these outer layers because they sort of push them out more than they can hold them together. And so they poof out into these really big, very pretty clouds of gas here. So lots of that red stuff you can see on the outside is some hydrogen and elements like that. Um, and most of this bluish greenish stuff is things like nitrogen and oxygen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, that looks really good. So you can really start to see those outer gases, how there's like a peak on the outside. And um, personally, I think this should be renamed. I don't think it should be named Dumbbell. I think it should be named like Apple Core or Bowtie. I Bow think it should be named Smart Bell. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> oh, come on. I try. Bri Brian, what'd you think about that one? <laughs> <laughs> He's agreeing. Brian says he liked it. <laughs> oh my goodness. That We're making Brian, Brian out to be off. this like lol cryptid behind the well, scenes. Well. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh dumbbell is one of uh one of my favorites. I think it's just really pretty to photograph. And um you can really see that core in this one, the the little white dwarf star in there. So uh it's pretty neat. But yeah. Um, ooh, so it looks like someone is also asking for yet another uh, open cluster. We're looking for M11, so the wild duck cluster. Now, another case of, of how don't great, let astronomers name things. <laughs> I know, I was going to say, speaking of how great they are at naming things, mm -hmm. uh, go ahead and put in the chat whether you think this looks like a flock of wild ducks or not. Yeah. Not this. Wait, wait for a second for the next one. Oh, yeah, no, that no, I no, promise no. it'll look like. A, a wild duck cluster. Oh, 100%. Not just a duck cluster. Oh, a certainly wild a wild duck, duck cluster. cluster. Yeah, absolutely. So as we can all see here, Brian, would you draw the duck for them? Uh, very clearly, there's a duck in this, and I don't really think I need to uh, explain it. It seems pretty self-explanatory to me, so. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, no, it's it's just, <laughs> it looks exactly like a yeah, wild duck oh, cluster. Clearly, so. yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. Oh, it uh, looks like the, uh, uh, there's the bill there that uh, Brian is. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like Daniel asked why the cigar galaxy is called so. Um, it's very simple. It looks like a cigar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Again, great with the names. <laughs> just, so, just, um, just stellar. Oh God. Uh, uh, Can someone kick him out of the chat? I'm please? here all week, folks. <laughs> They haven't been oh, able to man. Fire me yet. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> but yeah. So uh it's literally called the cigar galaxy because it looks like a cigar. It looked very similar to the like object. Vaguely we just cylindrical. At. It's I <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay, but with like smaller telescopes, it does look more like a cigar. You know? <sighs> I feel like that's being very generous. <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's, yeah, it's fine. fair. It's fair. Fine. It's not, you know, it it's not the best planetary nebula. It could be much worse. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and it looks like uh, Tom also, also asked for M13, which is the yes! other type of cluster. Yes. This yes. Do you want to take it over, Wesley? Yes, I would love to. M13 is gorgeous. This is one mm. of the prettiest things you can see with literally any kind of telescope or even just like binoculars if you have them yourself. Go out and try and find Hercules and then sort of below his his right armpit left from below one of his armpits is this extremely gorgeous globular star cluster. This was the previously uh, unnamed other kind of star cluster that isn't an open cluster. These things, unlike open star clusters are incredibly old and very red and very cool and very close to dying. Uh, these are sort of ancient decrepit falling apart <laughs> clusters of of proto galaxies is what they're called mm -hmm. and they're really really cool and they're very 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 densely packed they're some of the few places in the universe where stars are so densely packed that they can occasionally slam into each other just accidentally they're very very cool and they look gorgeous like i mean oh, yeah. it speaks for itself and m13 i mean this thing it's got like about half a million stars inside of it so that's just like 
an insane amount of stars. It's insane. And then uh, it's like it's somewhere around twenty thousand light years away. So these uh, these objects, these globular star clusters, they exist at the outer edges edges of our galaxy. So these are some of like the farthest things away in our galaxy that we are able to see. Yeah. And this... uh, we think. Yeah, we think these might be uh, cores of galaxies that Milky Way has consumed over time in galactic cannibalism, that super fun thing we talked about at the very beginning of this stream. But yeah, so um, M13. Just for comparison so that everyone knows, these are so far away from us that the, the light that Brian is currently getting pictures of right now left there about 23,000 years ago, which is around about the time humans were figuring out the wheel and fire <laughs> love that <laughs> so um yeah so this is a really pretty one and uh oh it looks like tom is also asking for m17 Ooh, this is one of my favorites the swan slash omega nebula it doesn't look like a swan it looks like a nose I think it looks like a swan. I think this is one of the few I'm, things that's like I, actually neat. Brian, Brian, you have control of the mouse. You you know that it looks like a nose. Brian. Yeah, yeah okay. Oh. Brian's saying yes. There we go. All right. Rude. When when we put it up, you guys please like verify. Everyone me in the vote chat. in the chat. It looks yeah, like everybody a get swan. in the chat and vote on whether this looks like a nose or a swan. We won't point we out put, either like, of them to you there. yet. We'll just, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> if somebody can get a poll going. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, See, it give it a second. Like, okay. Give it a second. Hold on. Hold on. Everybody wait. Everybody wait. The camera's still moving. Okay, okay, hold, okay, okay. hold on. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> Everyone hold your horses. I will not hold my horses. I, I like them free range. <laughs> you will let them free. All right. I'm very sorry. I would, I would never ask you to do such a thing to your horses. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Right. There it is. Everyone vote in the chat. I, I will be watching. Does this look like a swan or a... Okay, or a, well, we have to point it out first, okay? So nope, the swan nope, I just want is opinions. upside I just want down. Opinions. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, fine. Okay, go ahead and explain <laughs> what the swan nebula is then, Wesley, if you think it's no, a nose no, nebula. No, 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 no. I, don't, I, I just wanted us... I want our, I want our chat to, to be unbiased <laughs> by our opinions. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. All right. Show, them, show them what the swan looks like. Um, so the, the brighter part, the kind of longer part right there, that is supposed to be the swan's wing. And then uh, the kind of brighter part coming down from it is the head of the swan. So Jose agrees with me. That's <laughs> all I cared about. Thank you, Jose. That's, all right. you know, that's fair. I, all right. Now, now for the objectively correct interpretation of a cloud of gas thousands of light years away from us and what it kind of sort of looks like. Uh, is that it looks kind of sort of like a nose and not like a swan. And uh, Brian, if you would point to the uh, bridge of the nose, please. Brian, Brian, Brian if bridge. I could. Uh, yeah, the bridge of the nose is right there. And there's the, the nostril there at the end. Could you point to the oh. nostril, please, Brian? Thank you, Brian. Yes. And uh, oh, flying fish. Yeah, no, it kind of looks like a flying fish. People are saying That's in the chat, cool. it kind of looks like a flying fish. Cecilia. <laughs> uh, Cecilia from the Lowell Discovery Telescope, about 40 miles south of where Haley and I are in Flagstaff right now, says that we are both wrong. Uh, Cecilia, <laughs> what, what actually is this thing supposed to be? Yeah, what do you think it is? <laughs> if you just say we're both wrong, you, you gotta like give us something. <laughs> yeah, you gotta, you gotta give us a, an alternating, not exactly. noose, no, 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 not noose, a nose, it's a nose. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes. A couple of people say that they see an upside down swan. They they just had to turn their phones upside down to be able to see it. All so, right, all right, yeah. fine. It's fine. We'll have our difference of opinions. Do you want to Cecilia explain also what votes kind? Flying fish. I kind of like flying fish now. I'm a little honestly. It's grown on me. Yeah, I. You know, it is. I I agree. Tobacco cigar pelican. <laughs> Upside down <laughs> swan swimming. Thank you, Tom, for backing me up, man. <laughs> a bunch of people yeah, Tom's got fish. your back. <laughs> Tom's got my back. Oh, I love uh, it. <laughs> Davidian, it does not look like a wild duck. I will, I don't know who you are, but I will find you. No, th this is an anti-wild duck cluster <laughs> observatory. We are, we are anti-wild duck cluster. Love it. <laughs> Um, do you want to explain what this type of nebula is, though? So <laughs> we've just argued over what it nebula. looks like. <laughs> yeah, now that we've spent entirely too long arguing over what thing this arbitrarily looks like. <laughs> um, 
Well, this actually is is what's called a, a stellar nursery or a star forming region. So this is a an impossibly big cloud of gas, mostly hydrogen, out in space. Um, and what's happening in it is in some tiny little parts of it, you'll get a little pocket that's a little more dense than all the stuff around it. And since it's more dense, it'll be a little bit more massive. And so pull other stuff towards it with gravity and and keep going and going and going and going until you end up with so much gas in one spot that it starts smashing hydrogen atoms together in its core. And that's what a star is. And something like this will make anywhere from a few hundred to a few hundred thousand of those, depending on exactly the specifics of how it all works out. It's sort of an object to object determination. And it's kind of cool because inside of these uh, stellar nurseries, we don't 100% know exactly what happens when forming stars. So we are sending up the James Webb Space Telescope. Super exciting. So uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, it is uh, not replacing the Hubble telescope as a lot of people think. It's actually adding on to it. So um, there's a super fun thing called the electromagnetic spectrum. And a lot of people are like, don't think it's fun. I think it's fun. I studied optics. So this is like the coolest thing ever to me. Um, but the electromagnetic spectrum is basically this spectrum of any form that uh, light can take. So it can be like radio waves, which are super huge. Like the, the size of the wave from end to end is like, the size of a mountain, basically. And then it will go down to microwaves, uh, infrared, near infrared, uh, visible light, ultraviolet light. Those are the two that Hubble primarily sees in is visible light, and ultraviolet light. And then there's also um, x-rays and gamma rays. And um, the Hubble uh, views in visible and ultraviolet, but the James Webb Space Telescope is primarily going to study infrared light. And infrared light is basically heat vision. So it can look into these uh, stellar nurseries and not get clouded out by all of the, well, space cloud that's there. It'll be able to see the actual like stars inside of there. So it's gonna be super neat. I'm very excited about that. But yeah. Um, so yeah, and uh, cool. So it looks like someone is asking about NGC 869. So that would be the Perseus double cluster, which is not yet high enough, but we will be able to see it on next month's interactive stargazing. It'll be up high enough, but uh, currently it is just not in the uh, reach of our scope. It's not in our scope. Huh? What do you think? <laughs> did I nail it? <laughs> yes, you did a wonderful job. Thank I'm you. very proud of you. Awesome. Um, but it does look like somebody would like to see the Veil Nebula. Yes. This is also, this is, I love imaging the Veil Nebula. It's so it, cool. It is so cool. And it's like, you have to manipulate all of the stuff. So if you guys notice on the side of the picture, there's this whole bar and it's got like uh, gain, it's got contrast, it's got brightness, gamma, all of that fun stuff. So basically Brian takes in all of this light and he will um, take it all in and manipulate it until it looks good. So not only are we taking in a certain amount of light to make it look good, but we're also like with nebulae, uh, we tend to up the saturation just a little bit to like bring out the color more or we'll uh, like in the Whirlpool galaxy, we like up to the contrast quite a bit so that we could really see those dark spirals in there. Yeah, you can sort of just so. barely we start to see it coming into view now it's very very yeah fast. exactly so it's this it's is a super, star super. oh sorry oh go ahead <laughs> <laughs> this uh well it's not a star anymore actually so it's not a star i shouldn't have said that this was at one point a star that was very different than our own sun or than the stars that created those planetary nebulas we looked at a little bit ago though this is a star that was very 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 massive and what happens in stars like that is that they keep fusing elements up and up and up the periodic table so you get your helium you get your hydrogen atoms and you smash them together and you get a uh, helium atom and eventually once you've done all of that for millions and millions and millions or billions and billions and billions depending on how big the star is once you turn all of that hydrogen in your core into helium you start fusing the heliums at helium atoms together and then up and up and up and up until you get to iron um and the process of turning the element before iron into iron takes place in a number of minutes. It happens extremely, extremely fast. And when that happens, 
Uh, iron is a, it, it can't be used in this same fusion process that the star has been using to make energy for somewhere from billions to billions of years at this point of its life. And so it very rapidly starts collapsing in on itself because it's still really heavy and has all of this gravity that's crushing it together, but it's no longer fusing things. So the radiation pressure pushing outwards is all gone. And so it collapses in on itself and then matter really does not like being that close to itself starts to get close to violating some laws of physics. And so to counteract that, there is this massive, impossibly big explosion. And it is events like those massive supernova explosions that make all of the elements heavier than iron. So stuff like gold or uranium, anything like that, was either born in an event like this or something even more horrifyingly catastrophic to do with stars. <laughs> But uh, one of my favorite things to talk about with supernovas is they can actually, uh, they create not only these heavier, heavier elements, but they also create neutron stars. Oh, yes. Yeah. So neutron stars are insanely cool. So earlier we talked about the Dumbbell Nebula and how it was like a smallish medium star that had died. So the core cooled down, the outer gases expanded, it pushed out the outer gases, crunched in the inner gases. Now, um, I don't think we went into this too in, de uh, in detail, but basically all the inside stuff that crushes down doesn't lose any mass. It actually just loses empty space. So one of my favorite ways about talking about this is if everybody would join me and look at your hand. All right. So if you look at your hand, I can pretty much guarantee you remember a time you opened a door with this hand, right? I can guarantee a time you picked up a glass with this hand. Go ahead and give yourself a self five. Yeah. So <laughs> your hands are solid, right? And I know a lot of you are like, Haley, that's such a dumb question. Like, of course my hand is solid, right? Your hand is over 90% empty space. Yeah, there's empty space between the atoms in your hand. There's empty space between the bits of those atoms, the quantum bits of those bits. So imagine that I took out like half of that empty space. We're left with something maybe the size of a grain of sand, but it has the same amount of mass. And so that's what creates those white dwarf stars. Neutron stars happen at a much larger level. So uh, white dwarf stars, they come from stars maybe the size of our sun, which can currently hold about 1 million Earths inside of it. So very, very large. A white dwarf star, about the size of the Earth. So quite a bit smaller. These neutron stars come from extremely large stars. I'm talking like hundreds of times bigger than our sun. And the neutron stars are the size of Flagstaff. They are city-sized stellar objects, which is super cool because if you like took a teaspoon of neutron star, it would weigh more than the entire Earth. So... These, these things are really, really neat. They're really, really intense. The reason they're called neutron stars is because it, it forces the electrons inside of the like nucleus of the atom. So it just essentially the entire star is functioning as one really, really big atomic nucleus entirely made out of neutrons. And they are extremely weird. Sometimes they turn into something called magnetars that we do not fully understand, but they exert such an incredibly massive magnetic field. We were just talking about this in my electromagnetism class the other day. They exert such an intense magnetic field around them that they fundamentally alter the properties of chemistry in the areas around magnetars because they change what the electron orbitals around atoms are like, and that changes what the properties of elements are. So they fundamentally alter chemistry Mm -hmm. And if there's enough uh, stuff around the neutron star and it's spinning fast enough, it'll shoot material out of its poles, and that is called a pulsar. And pulsars are super, super cool. They were found by uh, Jocelyn Bell Burnell, and uh, I love talking about her because, um, like, strong women in STEM, yeah. Um, but uh, pulsars, they're so cool. They're some of the brightest things out there. And so if you guys have heard of, like, the golden record and the golden plate on the Voyager missions, there was a map of where we are in our universe based off of the closest pulsars to us because those are some of the brightest things uh, around us. So it's like a little little star map around here. So, um, but yeah, that's neutron stars. Um, They're super cool. And it looks like we have gotten confirmation that we can now see Andromeda Galaxy. So yeah, we're gonna go ahead and move to that now. Over. Um, 
Davidian music, you ask if Helix Nebula is visible. It's in sort of a weird part of the sky. We might try that a little bit later. Um, and Dale, you asked if we could see IC1396. Um, and it looks like it's uh, too large for the field of view of the telescopes that we're working with. Yeah, some, uh, some nebulae are really diffuse, so they're taking up quite a bit of space. And our uh, telescopes, they see a very small part of the sky. So for example, the Andromeda galaxy here, this is just the center of the galaxy. The Andromeda galaxy takes up, what is it, like 10 degrees in the night sky? It's like, huge. It's, it's huge. huge. And it will continue to get bigger. And currently, you can just barely see this with your naked eye if you know exactly where to look and exactly how to look for it. But you can see this thing with your naked eye. It's the furthest thing you away from where you are that you can see with your eyes. It's about 2.2 million light years away from us. But it'll continue getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger because it's hurtling towards us about 500 miles a second. And eventually, it'll crash into our Milky Way galaxy. Yeah, and that's going to happen next week, so everybody prepare. <laughs> <Mark> your <calendars. laughs> uh, go, uh, cosmically speaking, it kind of is next week. It's about four Honestly, and a half yeah. billion years from now. So yeah. around the time that the sun is turning into a planetary nebula is, mm -hmm. is when this thing will be happening. Yeah, exactly. So people always ask, well, will the Andromeda hit us first or will the sun explode? And the answer is, they'll probably happen around the same time. But it's sort of a astronomy, terrifying prospect. <laughs> <laughs> astronomy everything is on such a large cosmic scale that the margin for error is like hundreds of years <laughs> so um hundreds of years if you're lucky <laughs> exactly <laughs> so good times good times but yeah so uh the andromeda galaxy uh this is actually uh near and dear to our hearts here at lowell observatory because of our second director vesto slifer so uh, for those of you guys who know about Lowell Observatory, Vesto Slifer, he was our second director at Lowell, and he studied galaxies. And he was actually studying how they were moving towards us or away from us. And uh, specifically, he started with the Andromeda galaxy, and he saw that it was moving towards us. And it was going so fast that it had to be a galaxy of its own, because at first it was thought to be a nebula, uh, one of those like clouds of gases and dust out in space. And then he studied uh, many more of these objects, and he saw that all of them were moving away from us. And uh, he took his findings to the American Astronomical Society, and out in that sea of faces was young Edwin Hubble, who took it, this information and uh, did some data compilation, ran with it, proved the theory of the expanding universe. So um, all of that initial data for what is considered genuinely to be one of the most important scientific things that has happened in the last century, at least in astronomy, yeah, uh, that absolutely. started here. So really, really neat. <laughs> but yeah, um, it looks like Mizar and Alcor uh, will either soon be blocked by the Godot or is currently blocked by the Godot, Daniel. So, um, oh, it looks like Brian's going to try for us. So let's see. <laughs> I believe in you, Brian. Brian's our, our top crack scientist. He, if, if it can be done, he can do it. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, we're just I here to- I have the utmost like, faith in him. Yeah. We're just here to talk about what he's doing. You know, he's doing all the hard work. And we're just like having a, having a good conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just get to sit around and talk about fun stuff. Ah, yes, there it is. Nice. This thing's Ooh, really cool. So it used to be an ancient eye test. Yes. If your eyes were able to differentiate Mizar from Alcor, you had good enough eyes to be an archer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, Mizar and Alcor, it's it's really neat. It is both an optical binary and true binary. So uh, binary, it's two things, right? In this case, two stars orbiting around one another. So um, Alcor is a true binary. It's two stars that are actually next to each other orbiting around one another. And then Mizar and Alcor look like they're right next to each other in our night sky. So like Wesley was saying, if you can see um, both Mizar and Alcor in there uh, with your naked eye, then you have impeccable vision. So They're very um, faint. I was not good enough to be an archer in ancient Greece. You can sort of see them starting to come into view though now. Um, mm -hmm. Those, there's, you can, you can sort of differentiate them now. Uh, on the right of your screen, the two little points of light right next to each other, those are both Mizar. That's Mizar A and Mizar B. And there's actually four stars in that system, we think now. But mm -hmm. across the way on the left is is where uh, Alcor is. So they look very, very far apart on a telescope. But I promise they're right next to each other if you look with your naked eye. 
yeah, yeah, it's really cool. I uh, I can see it when my glasses prescription is up to date, but <laughs> um, yeah, mine's a little old. That's how I know that I need to get new glasses sometime soon. Honestly, <laughs> yeah, we have to see for our job, so I'll just like stare at my eyes and I'll like, go to the eye doctor. <laughs> true, it's very true. Yeah, so. Um, but yeah, um, oh, so we were going to check out the Helix Nebula. So Yes, um, the Helix Nebula. Yes, yeah, so let's see if we can find that. Um, it is in the haziest part of the sky. So like we were talking about <laughs> earlier, how there's a little bit of haze. We'll try. Um, we're going to, yeah. again, Brian is our, our top scientist, so. <laughs> Brian's got this. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's a pretty diffuse nebula. So even like on a super clear night, it is, um, you got to take like pretty long exposure to be able to see it. So uh, we're going to try. And by we, I mean, Brian and Wesley. And <laughs> we will cheer on. Brian on as Brian tries. We will provide moral support. <laughs> Go, Brian. Woo. <laughs> I, I believe in you. You can do it, Brian. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, let's see. Um, I see uh, 11. Oh, that's very bright. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> you um, could see it light up <laughs> my face on my screen. That's hysterical. <laughs> um, so it looks like uh, ah. we got a request for IC1101, uh, and that would be in uh, Virgo. So it is um, not able to be seen right now. Um, but it is really cool. It was, it's uh, the biggest known galaxy. And uh, during our Messier live stream, we did image it. So uh, if you guys have time to go check out the Messier live stream, it's on there, which is uh, really, really cool. But, um, oh, you can see it. The sky is hazy. Oh, my oh, gosh. Yeah, I, can, go, I can just barely see it now, yeah. I can totally yeah. see it. Wow. That's wild. I, that's, that is very dim. That's well, awesome. good luck, folks. Uh <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely there <laughs> it is there i promise i promise it did we didn't lose it it didn't go anywhere <laughs> yeah um i always think uh helix nebula kind of just looks like a really big version of the ring nebula <laughs> yeah well, i mean <laughs> it know? kind of is right well yeah yeah it is um <laughs> but like still it's yeah, like yeah, yeah similar yeah. shapes similar colors so i don't know for a while there, um, before I started working here, before I really got into astronomy, I thought that the Helix Nebula was the Ring Nebula, and that was just two names for the same object. It is, in fact, not. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, but yeah, you can see it in here. There's like a, a faint circle of red kind of on the outside. I can see some yellow right inside of that. And then there's some nice greenish blue on the center of the Helix Nebula. So um, really glad we got to show that to you guys because I was not expecting to, <laughs> yeah, to see I, this right I, now. I, I did not have high hopes. I know, right? Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> but yeah. Oh, uh, so they said they can do ring if we would Let's like to do ring, the ring Nebula. Yeah. So, um, they said, can do ring, will be better. So <laughs> <laughs> looks like it'll be better. <laughs> but yeah. I would believe it. Um, yes, it is similar to the Cat's Eye Nebula. That is another planetary nebula. Mm -hmm. So that you know, the reason that they're called planetary nebula, the word nebula actually means basically nothing. It comes from a time before we actually had any idea what any of this garbage that we were looking at was. And when we were looking at it with our ancient 1700s telescopes, it looked kind of cloudy. And so we assigned it the, the word that is the Greek word for cloud. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so planetary nebulas cloud. looked kind of sort of a similar size to planets. And so that's yeah. how we got that name that has unfortunately stuck and that we must use to this day. Why does it look so blue? Oh, there, oh we there we go. <laughs> I was so confused. That's, that's hysterical. <laughs> and then it magically didn't. All you had I know. Do. Brian, you're like a magician at this Brian's point. Incredible. Truly, truly. <laughs> a gentleman. I love the called. mouse lingo. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, it's, it's excellent. Yes, we, we definitely planned this all out earlier and are not inflicting it upon Brian randomly. Oh, yeah, no, of course. <laughs> We talked it over with him and oh, said, hey. Certainly, yes, absolutely, yeah. You're uh, ignore you ignore the mouse wiggles right now, don't. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> but, 
But yeah, this is the Ring Nebula, and you can see the little tiny white dwarf in the center there really, really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so layers of the the what was once the outer layers of the star sort of expanding out forever into the universe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, same uh, same type of object as dumbbell, uh, just different shape. And uh, a lot of planetary nebulas are different shapes. And as far as I know, we don't like 100% know why, which I know I've said a couple times tonight, (laughs) but um, (laughs) there's there's a lot going on in the universe. As long as we know about everything, there's always more to learn. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, that's why we're sending up bigger and bigger telescopes that can see and like other wavelengths of light and all that fun stuff. So yeah, and then it looks like someone also wants to see uh, Cat's Eye Nebula, which is also visible. So uh, a similar object, and it's actually really funny. We're getting smaller and smaller. The Helix yeah. Nebula was really big. The Ring Nebula is like medium size, and then the Cat's Eye Nebula is like teeny tiny in this. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, it's tiny. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think that's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can see uh, this is the the size that we had uh, the Helix Nebula in, right? So that it was like zoomed in just now when we were looking at Ring Nebula. It was completely zoomed out for Helix. So this is what Ring looks like now. And then that's Cat's Eye. <laughs> so it's tiny, yeah. Itty little dude. <laughs> but yeah. Same um, kind of thing though. Also another planetary nebula. Very cool mm-hmm. looking. Oh yeah. Look little, at that guy. Little tiny guy. The little dude. <laughs> He's got the blue around it. Oh yeah. Beautiful. Um, also, I've been told very frantically put in your last minute requests <laughs> there three exclamation marks on that so yeah very take important. seriously folks yeah yeah make sure <laughs> um so uh videographer experience you asked what telescope is funneling the photons for this image so photons the little tiny particles of light that are moving in a wave-like form and um it is a 14 inch plane wave telescope and it's got a uh Mallinckam Uh, hooked up to the back of it. It's a DSLR camera that's taking in uh, however many seconds of light based off of what object we're looking at. So uh, Brian is operating that guy out at the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory, which uh, conveniently is my background. So (laughs) this is the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory. And uh, I think I'm pointing at it, that one right there. That is, oh gosh, Ah, that one's our 14 inch. So um, that's the one we're looking through. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see um, if I can point to it on your background. <laughs> this one. Okay. <laughs> Let me see if I. Okay, the delay's caught up. Yes, I pointed it's the right like one. The oh, I'm furthest so tall one right here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, this image, by the way, is on our website. It's one of our branded uh, Zoom backgrounds. So, if you guys want to check those out, we've got a bunch of really cool ones. I really like this one. I just found it today. So, uh, very, very neat. But yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, Cat's Eye Nebula, that's this little teeny tiny guy here. Um, do we have any other? Oh, um, so our lovely Heather is putting the Zoom background link in the chat for this video. So if you guys are interested in getting these Zoom backgrounds, then go ahead and uh, click on that little link and it'll take you guys to our website. So um, does anyone have any other requests? Because if not, Wesley and I can throw some stuff out there. I think somebody asked for Algol. I think that's a star. Where? Where? In the I do not see. YouTube channel. So Al Ghul, uh, fun fact. Uh, so <laughs> the constellation Perseus kind of looks like a little frowny face. And um, Al Ghul is one of the dots on the frowny face, like one of the eyes on the frowny face. And uh, one of our coworkers one night when I like first got hired was telling me, um, I think he's actually outside right now, Curtis was telling me the name of the star was Al Ghul. And I thought he said Nazgul, like the witch king <laughs> in Lord of the Rings. Yeah, yeah like the and ring I rapes. I lost it. <laughs> I lost it. I was laughing so hard. So that's hilarious. Um, but yeah, so it is Algul, which uh, I believe translates uh, something like the demon's eye. So um, it's supposed to be Very like uh, Perseus's constellation is Perseus holding the head of Medusa next to him, and it's supposed to be one of her eyes is the star Algul. Terrifying. So, Very scary. Yeah. 
it's really cool. <laughs> Quite scary, but really cool. I'm very so, it's, it's um, an, it's an but it looks like the guy. dodo is in the way for us to yeah. see it. So, um, but it does look like we can see Triangulum Galaxy. Right. So, uh, M33 stat. Pinwheel. <laughs> Do you know that there's two galaxies called Pinwheel Galaxy? I did know that there's two galaxies called the Pinwheel Galaxy. Like, why? <laughs> um, now, Omar, you may live in Sacramento, California, but you could drive down here to lovely Flagstaff, Arizona, as the Milky Way. Uh, a little easier than that might be uh, you're sort of... Uh, I know this because I used to live a couple hours away from where you are now in Nevada. Currently, it's on fire, so not a great recommendation. But when it's not on fire, uh, up near Lake Tahoe has some pretty gorgeous stargazing. There's If you can get to a spot that is a little less light, it's just a couple mm -hmm. hours away from you. It is currently on fire, so I would not recommend visiting there right this exact second. But that's probably yeah. the best place near you to get good stargazing, Omar. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Just uh, somewhere where it's like fairly dark outside is where you can see the Milky Way and you don't need a telescope like to see Like beautiful it. Flagstaff, Arizona. <laughs> yeah, like beautiful Flagstaff. Um, you can see it with your naked eye. So you you don't even need a telescope or binoculars or anything like that. And uh, the darker the sky or like the darker the area is, the better you're going to see it. So if you live somewhere that's near the middle of nowhere, then go to the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and that's going to be exactly. where it's yep. going to look the best. <laughs> Directly to the middle of nowhere. Yes, exactly. Um, so yeah, um, this is Pinmeal, the Triangulum Galaxy. Um, this is also another one of the close the galaxies to us. Now. Yeah. Um, you, it's like super faint, but you can see like the nice spiral structure. It's called the Pinwheel Galaxy because it looks like a pinwheel. It's really gorgeous. Oh. <laughs> I love looking at this thing. Yeah. Yeah, it is really pretty. I like it a lot. Um, and then uh, can we get all four stars of Epsilon Lyrae, one and two in the same field of view? That's the double double, yeah? The double double, oh, I love it. Um, the double double. <laughs> the double oh. double. So it's, uh, oh, uh, Omar's thanking you. <laughs> yeah. Got your back, buddy. Nice, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, the double double, it's uh, called that because it is uh, two binaries, right? So, um, two binaries orbiting around one another. So um, binaries are like what we were talking about with Mizar and Alcor, where it's two stars in the same system. Um, if you guys are Star Wars fans, there's that planet Tatooine that has the double sunset in the background. So um, if there was a planet orbiting around a binary star system, it would be like that. It would have a double sunset in the background. Or in the double doubles case, I believe it would have Four, four suns, so um, it's a lot of be, it's a lot of light. That'd be very bright. I don't I don't lot. know how uh, I I need it totally dark to be able to sleep. I don't know how much sleeping I would I would get done on one of those planets. Right, it's like Alaska, but more intense. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, yeah. But instead of the one sun, it's maybe sometimes you have two of them up at the same time. Right, or all four. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds rough. That sounds oh, very, very rough. That sounds horrible. I could never. <laughs> mm. is that all four i see two i don't um i can't quite tell this is right. the double double i can't tell if this is both doubles i think it might be both doubles i think that's why we're dropping the exposure yeah, because the lower exposure will allow us to pull the two, the two apart yeah. so Oh um, yeah, I can see them now. They're yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can just barely see them. They're very, very close together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they look like they're like touching the top each ones other. Are like this and the bottom ones are like this. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the double double epsilon Lyrae in the constellation of Lyra the Harp. So um, this is actually the same constellation that Vega is in. Vega is the brightest star in Lyra, and then the double double is like pretty close to uh, to Vega. It's mm -hmm. like a only a couple degrees away or something like that mm -hmm. so um Lyra is the legendary harp of of greek musician of fame orpheus if you've ever heard mm -hmm. that name before some of you may have yeah yeah it was given to him by the god apollo the god of music because uh orpheus was this like fantastic musician he was like hey you're so good i'm gonna give you this awesome um like magical harp <laughs> 
So it um, looks like we're not getting any requests in. So I have We are request. receiving. Oh. Can we look at Triffid? Is that is that too far in the yeah yeah ooh okay Sick. I love the Triffid Nebula I think it is so pretty because it's three different types of nebula like right next to each other so um, it's got like the stellar nursery aspect of it which uh, stellar nurseries are typically pink because pink is hydrogen and like we were talking about earlier stars fuse hydrogen at their cores um, to be able to um, like form and live out their lives. And so there's a nice little cloud of hydrogen and then running through it is a nice little dark nebula. So lots of uh, thicker dust. And then the bluer part towards the top is a, uh, is a reflection nebula. So it's uh, gases that are being like backlit basically. Yeah. So the pointing is a little off. Normally we sort of move it around and, and dial things in, but we are, we are receiving signals to start winding things down right now. Yes. <laughs> Looks like this uh, would have to be the last object. We have Sad to set times. Brian free soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've got him locked in a closet right now. <laughs> <laughs> Forced to slave away on our telescope operating. Yeah. <laughs> we just never let him go. You know, he just sits there. <laughs> Brian lives in the Godo. <laughs> But yeah, so um, this is the Triffid, one of my favorites. Um, I think it's a pretty good object to end on, right? Because it's, it's yeah. like a nice little combination of things, right? Yeah. So um, don't forget remember, to subscribe guys... to this channel and tune in on the what is the first Tuesday of every month? Yes, first Tuesday of every month. Mm -hmm. We will be here doing this or some people similar to us, if it's not us. Yeah, Talking and we'll also be doing um, some uh, Clark 125th events. So our historic Clark telescope turned uh, 125 this year. So very, very nice. It is older than the state of Arizona. So oh, satellite went through the picture. Look at that. Oh, satellite. <laughs> but yeah, so um, you guys are enjoying our content. Feel free to subscribe. Um, I highly recommend it because um, I'm totally not being uh, sponsored to say this, right? Neither <laughs> of us have been paid to say anything. Please subscribe. Yes, please subscribe. <laughs> but seriously, we have some really cool content that comes out all the time, not just our interactive stargazing, but we also do special events for like uh, for like the Clark 125th, or we've done uh, opposition, lunar eclipses, all kinds of really cool stuff. So if you're into space, then this is the place to be. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Cecilia, please smash that like button. We would yes. greatly appreciate it if you would smash that like button and Absolutely. leave a comment. I Can you... I guess you can co leave a comment on this if you're watching this as a VOD later. I don't know why, I don't know if anyone does that. If you are doing that, leave a comment to me, Wesley Sonamaker, and also send me a letter <laughs> somehow. I don't yeah. know how you would acquire my address. But everyone is uh, asking us to uh, wind things down now, so I will, uh, <laughs> we will begin the process of signing off with that. Uh, thank you for watching, Absolutely. everyone. We really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. We really, really appreciate it. Um, I am Haley Osborne. Write me a letter as well. Um, I am Wesley Sonmaker. For every letter that you write, Haley, write me two letters. Um, no, write me three letters for every letter you write, Wes. If you say that, then they just get in an infinite loop of continuing to write both of us letters for forever. That I, exactly. I don't know if we're allowed to receive that much mail. That seems like too you much know, mail. I don't care that much. <laughs> just just send buckets of mail to us. Anyway, um, we should be done now. <laughs> we should be done now. We are now done. Now it's, if you're watching now, you shouldn't be able to. Um, I don't know how you got here. The video's over. Um, everything, it's all done. I, I don't even know how you got let in here. Um, okay. Thank you guys for coming. Bye. <laughs>